as women, we've historically been uh, marginalized financially, had much less autonomy financially. So we've historically had to be in competition with each other for um, partners that would historically support us. The more that changes, the more we're, we're saying, I don't need that, so I'm gonna make my own choices. Today I'm gonna talk about ageism because it's showing up, it's in the news, and I'm glad for that because it needs to have attention, we need to be talking about all the ways that ageism is still in full, full force, in full flow in 2022. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I did a little video about the fact that Lisa Laflamme was uh, fired from CTV uh, for an unknown reason, but after some concern about her undyed hair, uh, and also after some conflicts with one of the executives at the network, because she was known, uh, apparently, purportedly, for taking a strong stand against ageism, inequity, racism in the newsroom. So we don't really know what happened, but we do know that she was the anchor on a very popular news show for 35 years, she was let go and asked not to say anything about her contract being canceled, in spite of the fact that men much older than her on the same network had worked for decades longer and been given beautiful farewells where they got a chance to say goodbye to their, to their people, by the way, who were also either gray and or bald. So it does look like an example of bias and ageism. And the problem when we talk about things like ageism, racism, um, sexism, is that, is that it is hard to prove. And that doesn't make it less true. It doesn't make it less relevant. It doesn't make it less a situation in which we actually are impacted by it. And the ways that we're impacted go so very deep around choice. When we do not have equity, we do not have financial parity, we do not have the same access to to resources and to career development. And there's one gender that's more often uh, doing the lower and unpaid work or being discriminated against. We suddenly have less choice. And when we have less choice, we have less power and the system, uh, it goes deeper and deeper into a systemic situation. Uh, Sister, may I say peace and blessings to you? Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I wanted to talk about some of the responses that I've been getting. In fact, I, after I posted that TikTok, NBC News reached out to me to ask me to make comments uh, on the story. And I did a little interview with one of their correspondents the next day and did a 10 or 15 minute interview where I had a lot of talking points that I wanted to share. And I wanted to get straight to the points because as a speaking coach, I know that we are the ones that have to control the narrative. When we're interviewed, we can't just respond to the question as asked. We need to know what it is that we want to communicate. And so I was pretty careful about having that planned ahead of time. But <laughs> as is the case with the news often, they had a very particular agenda. And you know, I ended up being on the clip for a very, very, very short amount of time. And they really wanted the correspondent to be able to say, so there is a silver lining when I raised the point that I'm glad that the topic is coming to the light. I'm glad that networks are picking it up because it needs to be talked about. So very few of the points that I wanted to make were included. You know, if you have thoughts on it, if you have personal experiences, it's great to share them. It's delicate to take a strong stance on things like this because it's very easy to be seen as angry or to be seen as, uh, you know, in a negative light. Uh, there's uh, so much of the discrimination goes pretty deep. And so for a lot of people, it's scary to speak out. And the truth is, I mostly don't speak out. I mostly try to take a positive stance and be a positive example of artful aging rather than call attention to the inequities because it feels risky. It it feels it feels vulnerable. It feels like you were sort of putting yourself into the fire. And so, so many times we don't speak out about, um, you know, when things that are inappropriate happen. I mean, that's the reason why the Me Too movement was so powerful when people started to speak out collectively and it gave permission to, uh, to other women and other victims of sexual abuse to speak out against it because they knew they weren't alone. Uh, at some point, someone has to take the risk and make it okay for other people to speak up too. And so I try to be that person. It is hard, it's hard to be that person sometimes because it does feel vulnerable. But 
sometimes it's got to be done. I stopped dyeing my hair in a couple of years before the pandemic, but so many women, it has become a, a movement, I would say. And now, more recently, even since since COVID's happened, so many more women who are in the public eye have also stopped dyeing their hair. And it's not going to change things overnight. They're still going to be discriminated against. Women still in Hollywood have uh, much less access to good parts, although that's changing. It's documented that women have many fewer words and lines in in Hollywood. Um, so, you know, a representation is limited compared with men's. And I think that's what needs to change. And that's what I'm personally pretty committed to is showing up in a way that says, hey, we're here, we matter, we're relevant. And, uh, you know, encouraging other women to do the same and linking arms with lots of other creators over 50 who are saying we're here and we're not going away and we have money and we are increasingly having more autonomy and sovereignty and uh, impact on how we spend our money and how we you know, how we use our attention. So the, it's the attention economy right now, right? And so that's why I'm always encouraging people to find their story, to speak up, to to get on social media, to share what they know because someone needs to hear it. And that's why that's the message you'll keep hearing me saying over and over again. You need to tell your story. You need to find the message that's relevant to you. Use the experience that you have in this this delicate world of being a human being uh, to 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 communicate with others, so that you give permission to other people to tell their story, and so you help some people feel less alone. I deeply believe that until we speak up and say what's true, until we have our voices heard, we will have a hard time changing things. It is in the speaking up, it is in the sharing our stories where change happens. The correspondent on NBC that I was interviewed by said, well, why is this such a big deal? It's just hair. And my response to that is, yes, it's just hair and it shouldn't matter. And there's no moral right or wrong to either dyeing or to not dyeing our hair, but it's a, unimportant symbol of some of the discrimination that still occurs. And so until we get to the place where it actually is just another hair color and people aren't responding to it in ways where, uh, where there's an undertone of ageism or there's associations to things like effectiveness or where it's associated to uh, women not being relevant or you see women saying, oh, you know, she's let herself go. Until we have that gone, which is going to require more people to make it as a choice, it's going to require more people to show up and say, hey, I'm here and don't conflate inability or competent, like incompetence or the right to pay me less or the, or, you know, other aspects of sexism in with it. It's a meaningful uh, symbol. So it seems like it's just hair, but until there are no longer assumptions about women who choose not to dye their hair, then it's an important symbol that we need to acknowledge and talk about for better and for worse. And and not shying away from taking, you know, having fun with expressiveness through makeup and hair and clothes, but also willing to show up and say, here's what I really look like, here are my real, my real wrinkles, and to take a stance for that too. And for me, that's the important thing is that it's not about one way or another way for us to, um, to behave or to show up or, uh, but rather that we have choice and that there's no discrimination in relationship to it. Recently, a friend of mine who is very passionate about changing the way we see body types posted a very strong stance that said, Botox is not self-care. And it's interesting because I, I don't personally use Botox, but I feel really strongly that it's not for us to discriminate against other people for whatever choices they make. There is nothing inherently good or bad, morally right or morally wrong about changing 
our faces, changing our hair color. There's nothing inherently wrong about dyeing hair. There's nothing inherently better about not dyeing hair. There's nothing better. There's nothing inherently right about not using Botox or about using it. Uh, the, the bottom line is we are on our own personal journeys and what we choose to do for ourselves is hopefully, hopefully motivated by our desire to be more sovereign, to be more empowered, to be happier, to feel good about ourselves. And if that is the intention and the effect, then I say everyone makes their own choices and we can stand behind each other's choices um, as we claim the right to make choices for ourselves. When we support and, and encourage another woman's autonomy and personal choice, we also take a stand for our own. The other thing that I said in my little interview that was ended up on the cutting room floor is that as an independent um, content creator and as someone who mostly works for myself or as a contract coach, I have a lot of sovereignty and I feel grateful for that. I feel that it's a huge privilege for me that I don't I'm not beholden to a corporation or to someone, a boss or to a network, although I have been in that position. In fact, I was a film and television actor in the same city where Lisa LaFlamme works, and I was on TV shows that were aired on that network on CTV. And in fact, interestingly, I also played a reporter on a show that was aired on CTV in the early 90s. I was a, a series regular on a show called ENG, and I played a reporter, a young reporter who... Oh my God, there's so many interesting layers. I did leave the film and television business because I felt that at that time, there were not great roles for women over 35. And I'm super glad to see that that is changing. It's not fully changed yet. There's still a lot of work to be done, but it has changed a lot since I was a film and television actor. The roles for women are getting older and they're getting deeper and they're getting more well-rounded in terms of the characters. And I'm happy to see that happening. But when I was an actor, I was dependent on someone saying, okay, we're going to give you a job. I had to go to auditions and callbacks and hope and, 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 you know, and suffer the heartbreak that all actors suffer when you don't, when you have to work really hard to get a part or you are turned down for nine out of 10 or 99 out of a hundred roles that you audition for. And when you're in that situation, when you're beholden to someone else for your livelihood or for work or for money or for, mm, you know, impact or presence or representation, you don't have as much power. But because I'm an independent content creator and I'm committed to women in their 40s, 50s and 60s telling their stories and sharing their their experience and taking up space so we can change the outdated narratives on aging, that I feel it's incumbent on me to talk about these situations, even though they're not popular. I feel it's incumbent on me to keep on talking about it, maybe even because it's not popular and because I have the ability to do so because I'm not beholden to anyone. There are women and people who have marginalized identities who might want to speak up against the inequity they experience but don't feel they're able to because they are dependent on their jobs or their network or their bosses being approving of them. So that's why I feel it, it, it feels contingent upon me to take advantage of the fact that I am sovereign. I have the privilege of autonomy in, on many levels. So it, I need to speak up for that reason, even though, believe me, I don't always want to. I think the silver lining, as the journalist made the joke, you know, the silver lining in this is that we are speaking about it more now and that the news is has picked it up as a story and that people are coming out in support of the women who have chosen to say, I, I want the choice to dye or not dye my hair. I don't want to be, um, you know, at the mercy of companies that are selling me products to have me... Uh, fit into the image of younger because it's just the image of younger right the truth is that there are many people in their 20s 30s and 40s who have white silver gray hair and often who feel that they have no choice but to dye it there's a lot of decoupling we need to do between white and silver hair and a lot of associations that we make to it the more financial sovereignty we have as women and people with marginalized identities the more 
ability we have to speak up and to say what's true. Just dye your hair black. Why? Black superior. Why should I dye my hair black? Tell me, tell me. Like, I would love to know. Tell me the reason I should dye my hair black. Because this is what we're talking about right now. I don't know if you're just coming in late. But that's exactly what we're talking about. The thing that is really the most important about the financial sovereignty and why I feel really committed to women in their 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond, as well as people with marginalized identities, having more money is that when we are sovereign financially, uh, then we have the ability to say what's true for us, to speak up. We don't have to hold our voices back. And we have our own platforms on social media now to speak what's true for us. We have inc increasingly have emotional and financial sovereignty that that gives us choice and power. And the more brands like Dove are starting to realize that our existence matters and that we are viable, we're a viable population that spends money, the more they're gonna get on board with creating new stories and new narratives, the more things change. So yeah, Black Superior, you know what, you're right. By people's perception of the narrative, I would look 10 years younger. By your perception of what age is, I would look 10 years younger. But why should I want to look 10 years younger? I'm 57. Why should I not look 57? I don't think, I think I look 57. I think that if I did dye my hair, people who associate white hair with age would think that I look younger. But why? Why does that matter? And why should it matter? I'm, I'm super curious. And I'm, and I'm wondering if if you're willing to be honest, if you apply that standard more to women than to men, like, would you dye your hair? Would you get a hair transplant if you started going bald? You know, I'm 57. I'm going to be 58 in January. Who wants to look old? Nobody. Okay, so Black Superior, if you don't want to look old, would you get a hair transplant so that you would look younger? And Believe me, a lot of men do because it's really scary for men to go bald because it is the thing. You know, we have a culture that says it's okay for men to have white hair. They look like silver foxes and they're sophisticated. Black superior. Yes, you would get a hair transplant. You want to look young forever and healthy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, listen, I have a model that I call artful aging. And there are four tenets to artful aging. And artful aging means the first tenet of artful aging is optimization. That means making the most of whatever it is that we have. But if you're committed to looking young, forever and healthy, I hate to break it to you, but you are going to fail. The reality is that you are going to age. So I'll jump right from the first tenet of artful aging, which is optimization. That means making the best of everything that we've been given. The best doesn't necessarily mean younger, except that we live in a culture where youth is so idealized that we forget that there's beauty and power and impact, even beauty in aging. Now, would you look at a tree and say, oh, that one tree that's very thin and spindly is beautiful, but that that oak tree is ugly because it's older and more gnarly? No, in nature, we recognize the beauty of all things. But we have these very limiting beliefs about human beings and especially about, about uh, women uh, that say that they have to be a certain thing or a certain type of thing in order to, um, you know, to be acceptable and to be viable. So the fourth tenet of artful aging is gracious acceptance. And they hate to say it, but if you are going to be impacted in a way that is, um, you know, going to impact your, your health, your happiness, your self-acceptance by only feeling good about yourself when you're young, um, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer because part of the experience of being a human is accepting that we do age. I'm 66 years old. You will not stay looking young forever, no matter what you do. Yeah, I don't know how old you are, Black Superior, but yeah, I, it's really true. You just aren't. You are 50 what exactly? Because I just turned 30 last month and I already look older than you. Okay, so know that even when I turn off all the filters, TikTok does filter a little bit. So I would say if you saw me in person, my skin isn't as smooth as it looks. I, I try not to have filters on because I don't want to represent myself in ways that are not... Um, not true. Um, but my skin is pretty good. I take pretty good care of it. And some of it is just luck and, and genetics. Uh, but I do also believe skincare is really important. Um, and we are all different. So well, maybe whatever it is that you think makes you look older, don't forget one, we're our worst critics. 
We are our worst critics. And second of all, you probably have some other beautiful element that is your gift, your physical gift. And I don't know what it is. We all have something and we all have things that are less. I don't choose to do Botox. I don't have anything against it. Like if Botox is something that you do because it makes you feel good and all power to you. I have nothing against it. I don't personally choose to do Botox and I actually like these wrinkles. I think they show smile lines. Aging is something that's going to happen to us. It's something that we're going to have to come to terms with. It's just there's no two ways about it. Admins, I'm scared of aging. It scares me a lot. You're scared of aging because we live in a culture that villainizes aging. Not all cultures are like that. Many other cultures don't vilify aging. And in fact, there are many cultures that revere aging. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that that people are, you know, Linda, I think you're right. Um, that it's a gift to age. But the thing is, we have to come to terms with some aspects of wisdom to recognize that 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 aging is something that's precious. And sometimes for people, it's a, a, a life threatening illness or a brush with death or losing something important to them where they realize, oh, you know what, all of these things don't matter. What really matters is my relationships and my self-esteem and what matters is my health. But all of us are in a process to coming to that. There's a reason that people, starting from my experience in around their mid-30s, especially women, start to feel afraid of aging. And that's because in our culture, it costs you something to age. So earlier, um, black superior said something like, if I dyed my hair, I would look younger. And the truth is that if we can make ourselves look younger, if we can use anti-aging products in a way that work, some of them work, some of them don't, we will have access to things that, you know, if we're, if we're not sovereign, if we're not, if we are dependent on other people's approval and paying us and all those things, uh, need the need for love, we will lose things. So I, I, I did a video about this saying that there's a reason that people don't want to say how old they are. Now, I have a principle of saying my age because I want to change the narrative on aging. But there's a reason that many people don't want to tell how old they are because they lose access to things. I know many dancers. I'm a dancer and I know many women dancers who will not say how old they are because they know it's going to impact how people think about them. It's going to impact how people, much people want to dance with them. Uh, I know many people who don't want to say their age because they feel they will be perceived as less relevant in their work. And the reason is because it's still true. They probably will by some people. So there is a re very good reason why some people are afraid of aging. Um, but that's also why I want to talk about it. And it's why I want to change the story on aging because I don't like the fact that that's true. Linda says, I agree with you. My grandson passed away at 22 months old. That changed everything. I'm so sorry. And yet, isn't it true that it's when we have a loss that we realize the preciousness of life and all the gifts that we're given? And maybe we change our perspective on some of the things that seem so important that suddenly become less so. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, I have a personal, um, a personal intention that I don't buy products that have anti-aging on them because part of my intention about changing the narrative on aging is I want to support brands that are for radiance and support the idea of radiant of women and people in general having a much wider idea about beauty diversity and what that means. And so my intention is to choose products that don't promote anti-aging. I do have one product that I love that I would love to find an alternative to that doesn't call itself anti-aging. Uh, it's a glycolic, um, glycolic acid toner. Um, so if anybody knows of a good glycolic acid toner, I would really like to know of one. Um, it's admin says it's scary apparently because I don't have family of my own, no husband, no kids. Society makes it worse. Yeah. And that's another thing. I know when I first became single after being married for 20 years that I went through a period of feeling, um, like how am I, you know, what am I going to, how am I going to not be alone? Am I going to, maybe I'm going to be alone for the rest of my, rest of my life. Um, I'm going to be, you know, am I going to be too old to be perceived as attractive? All those kind of things. And it, it took me through a journey of realizing that I actually am fine being alone, but it took me a while to get there, to get to the place where I've realized, okay, I'm okay being alone. Um, and it's not easy to do in our culture, especially when we have financial inequity between men and women. 
uh, which again is why I'm so committed to women having more financial autonomy so they don't feel the need to have men, but they can have relationships with men because they choose to, not because they have to. Um, so when we get to come to terms with our being willing and being able to be alone, then, uh, then we can actually focus on the things that feel most vitally important to our hearts and to our souls and to our spirits, to our minds. Admin specialists, I'm black and it's not easy over here. <sighs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we unfortunately still live in a culture that has so many isms and there is so much inequity. Um, between, you know, there's just so many ways that, uh, that, that privilege, privilege and wealth need to be more equitably shared. My, my intention is to try to change that. And some of that has to do with what the gift that I can give is to help people find their voice and speak up. And th that's the way that I try to help think, change things. What was the question, Black Superior, about my hair that I didn't answer? I'm a special. I, I really hear you, and I, and I. That's why I say women and people with marginalized identities. If you're at the intersectional space of isms and discrimination, then it's like that much more complicated. Wig question. I didn't see it. Sorry. What was your question about the wig? I have lots of wigs. I love wigs. My hair is actually getting quite thin, and I figure that at some point I'm gonna probably chop my hair all off really short and wear wigs openly, um, you know, explicitly, not like try to hide it. Um, so I don't know what your question was, but I am, I don't have much experience with wigs, but I love wigs and um, um, I'm, I'm wanting to get more comfortable with them as part of my future because I do think that they're going to be in my future. Yeah, I didn't see a wig question either, but hey, what's your wig question? Let's go there. Let's talk about the wigs. So you'd wear a wig but not dye your hair. What a contradiction. You would get a transplant. Okay, so hold on a sec. What's the contradiction? I'd wear a wig but not dye my hair. I don't get what the contradiction is. I, there's no con I don't see any contradiction. I would dye my hair. I, I used to dye my hair. I might dye my hair in the future. I have, nothing, I have nothing against dyeing hair. What I don't like is the fact that women who don't dye their hair experience discrimination on the basis of that. Yeah, and if I did wear a wig, I probably would wear. In fact, most of the wigs I have are gray, and and I think that if I was going to wear a wig, I would wear a wig that was m more this color, like more all white rather than salt and pepper. That would be my preference for color. Thank God I met you today. You made me feel better. Oh, thanks, Eddie, Miss Special. I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't really see the contradiction because I'm not saying like as I think it was pretty clear before. I don't hold a moral positive or negative to dying or not dying. I don't believe that using Botox is morally superior or morally inferior. I don't believe there's any right or wrong or morality to what we choose to do with ourselves. What I want is for everyone to have freedom of choice and for our choices to not impact um, discrimination or loss of jobs or you know negative perceptions that need to be broken down. So I don't know. I'm not Sure, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, and, and yes, and for sure, if I wore a wig, I would like to wear a gray wig or a mixed wig. That might be it. If you're not following me or not friends, first of all, if you're a creator, let me know what you do content about because I try to follow all my friends who are creators. If you're interested in speaking skills and empowerment for women in any kind of communication, improving how we communicate with each other, uh, artful aging content, and sometimes I even talk about ADHD because it has an impact on me. Any of those things are things that uh, you could follow me for.